Julia's body was lying on the rug on the floor, feet towards the fireplace. Her head had been badly battered and it appeared that she had been dead for a while. There was a large gash above her left ear and her skull had been shattered. Mr Johnson went to fetch the police and doctor and he told his wife and William not to touch anything in the house. The pair removed themselves to the kitchen to await the arrival of the authorities. William noticed that a shelf in the kitchen where he had kept his potential collection box had had its door torn off at the hinges and so he took down the metal cash tin and found that around £4 had been taken, a sum worth around £260 today once adjusted for inflation. Meanwhile, Mr Johnson had alerted his local GP, Dr Dunlop, and continued on to the police station where he told the PC on desk duty who informed and dispatched PC Fred Williams to the scene. PC Williams arrived at Wolverton Street at 9.10pm and took Julia's pulse, finding no signs of life. He and William then checked the upstairs bedrooms, during which William explained to the PC the brief details of his trip to find the non-existent Men Love Gardens East. The two rear rooms appeared undisturbed, but the front bedroom where Julia kept many of her personal items was found a scene of some distress. Julia's hats were strewn across the room, bedclothes were pulled from the bed and pillows and handbags were lying on the bed and floor, though it appeared as if nothing had been stolen. The two moved back down to the kitchen and sat down at the table. William noticed Julia's handbag and he checked the contents, noting again that nothing appeared to have been stolen, including cash, just as a second police officer, Sergeant Breslin, arrived at Wolverton Street and a sudden flurry of activity swept through the house. Dr John Edward Whitley McFall, Professor of Forensic Medicine from the University of Liverpool, along with the Detective Superintendent Hubert Moore and the head of the Liverpool Special Branch, Sergeant Adolphus Fothergill, also showed up to inspect the scene. McFall inspected Julia's body and noted that with no defensive wounds, many of the blows to the head would have been administered while she was face down on the floor, concluding that it was a prolonged and frenzied attack. He gave a time of death for Julia to be around six hours previous, estimated from a state of rigor mortis as it had spread through the body. The night was a long one for William, as police came and went until the early hours of the next morning. William told and retold his movements for the night time and again, and was inspected for traces of blood, none of which were found. Eventually, Julia's body was removed from the house at 1.15am, leaving behind William's blood-stained mac lying in a macabre pile amongst blood-matted hair in the centre of the lounge. It was 4am before William was driven to the house of his sister-in-law, where he had planned to stay during the police investigation of his home on Wolverton Street. There was little sleep to be had that night, both for William, who was in a state of some shock, and the police, whose work had only just begun. Over the subsequent days, Julia's autopsy revealed that she had died from one of 11 wounds on her head, administered by a blunt object, that was assumed to have been a metal bar and quite possibly a fire poker found to be missing from the Wallace's home. Despite extensive searches of the area and local drains and sewers, no murder weapon was ever found. The grisly murder was causing a considerable stir in the area and theories and suspicions as to the identity of the killer quickly began circulating. Almost immediately, rumours began circulating concerning the murder of Julia Wallace and suspicions that William was the killer followed promptly. Within a matter of hours, people were passing on slithers of information, some gleaned from facts and others manufactured as the story travelled through Anfield. Wallace was also suspect number one as far as the police were concerned, simply by association as is common in preliminary stages of a murder investigation. The Wallaces were seemingly inoffensive with no enemies and though £4 had been taken from William's lockbox, there were many valuables left behind as well as cash in Julia's handbag in the kitchen. In fact, there was really little else for the police to go on at this early point in the investigation. The police immediately began taking testimonies from witnesses as they came forward as well as attempting to corroborate Wallace's own story of his movements whilst hunting down the non-existent Men Love Gardens East a story that he had recounted step by step in his first official statement. One key witness turned out to be Alan Close, a 16-year-old milk delivery boy who had delivered milk to the Wallaces and was the last to have seen Julia alive at 6.45pm. He was cajoled by his friends to tell this information to the police, which he did and had his story corroborated by the local paperboy who saw both Alan Close and Julia at the time. 
This information meant that if William Wallace was indeed the killer, he had just over 20 minutes to murder his wife, clean himself up and make the journey to the tram stop to catch a tram by 7.06pm. The journey on foot between Wolverton Street and the tram stop on the corner of West Derby Road was a distance of 605 yards and it was a journey that was repeatedly reconstructed by police who found it to be a close call. At times they actually ran the journey just to extend the amount of time it would give the hypothetical Wallace to murder his wife, clean up and feign a robbery. It was a stretch, but with no other suspects, the suspicion continued to fall on Wallace, who the police theorised had made the call to the chess club the previous night himself to set up his own alibi. There was only one other suspect at the time, a man known both to Wallace and the police, Richard Parry. Richard Parry was born on the 12th of January 1909 in Liverpool, the first of six children to William John Parry, a treasurer to the Liverpool Corporation, and Lillian Jane Evans. The family was comfortable financially and staunch Methodists. Richard's father was a fairly distinguished Liverpudlian, a veteran of the First World War. He went on to serve as treasurer or chairman on several boards and committees across the city. Richard, the eldest son, had a lot to live up to or rebel against. Whilst at school, Richard Parry suffered his first brush with the law. Every morning as he walked to school, he pulled down a boundary wall surrounding the building sites of new houses being erected along his route. He did it so often that it had become part of his morning routine, and eventually this caught up with him as the builders stood watch to catch whoever was causing the damage. The damage he had caused was quite considerable, and he was eventually convicted at a juvenile court for damaging property. Whether or not this foreshadowed his future misdemeanours, or was just a youth causing mischief is something unknown, but it caused great stress to his well-to-do family. Whilst at school, Parry developed an interest in acting and he joined the school's dramatic society, where he met his future girlfriend, Lily Lloyd. In 1923, he left school and in 1926, he joined the Prudential as an apprentice insurance salesman, whilst continuing his interest in acting through joining the Mersey Amateur Dramatic Society, which met in the same building as Wallace's Chess Club every Thursday night. During bouts of William's illness, Richard Parry was asked to cover for William's work during the winter of 1928. William noted that the cash that Parry had collected from William's patch and had been bringing to his house had some discrepancies. When confronted about this, Parry smoothed the whole thing over by paying out of his own pocket to cover the losses. Parry became a suspect for the murder for having a known motive. He had been confronted by William for discrepancies in his takings and this may or may not have led to a mutual agreement arranged between Parry, his father and the Prudential on his departure from the company. Furthermore, he knew the interior of the house and he would have been a familiar face to Julia who may have let him into the house without any concern. Parry had frequented the same cafe as Wallace as a member of the Mersey Amateur Dramatics Club and he could easily have seen the timetable for members of the chess club which hung on a notice board by the door. There are also hints to the police that Parry may have had a somewhat more intimate relationship with Julia, though this was all speculation at the time. Wallace himself had given Parry's name to the police during his initial statement as a person Julia would have let into the house whilst he was not home. The police really had very little else to go on and so investigations into Parry's whereabouts were undertaken. As it happens, On the night of the phone call, Parry had been visiting his girlfriend, Lily Lloyd, a fact backed up by her mother, Josephine Lloyd, who told the police that Parry had dropped by the house at about 7.15pm, the exact time the call was being made to the chess club by Coltro. The phone box itself was able to be tracked via the records taken by the operator's supervisor due to the initial failed connection, and it was found to be in Rochester Road, some 20 minutes drive away from Lily's house. This appeared to be a solid alibi for Parry, More damningly for Wallace, it was a mere 400 yards from his own house. As for the night of the murder itself, apparently, apparently had an alibi covering himself for that too. He stated that he had dropped by to see a Mrs. Brine, where he had stayed until 8.30pm. Also present were her daughter and nephew. He then went out and bought some cigarettes and a paper from the post office, and then onto a store on West Derby Road to inquire about a battery for a radio. He dropped in on a friend, Mrs Williamson, to chat for 10 minutes concerning her daughter's upcoming 21st birthday plans at around 8.30pm and then on to collect Lily from the local cinema where she worked. 
Both Lily and her mother confirmed he then stayed from 9pm until 11pm that night before leaving to return home. These were not the only witnesses for Parry's whereabouts that night however, but for now the police found the alibi to check out, and the inquiry into Parry as a suspect died down. Instead the police refocused their efforts onto Wallace, dispatching a plainclothed officer to tail him and notice every move. Still, the police were busy re-enacting Wallace's journey, figuring it to be an average of 18 minutes, and thus they concluded that Wallace would have had the time to do what he needed and still make the tram by 7.06pm. They didn't, however, account for any cleaning of bloodstains from skin or clothes, nor for Wallace's poor health, but regardless, Inspector Moore was quite happy with the results. Wallace was pulled in once again to give a fourth statement to police, and despite no glaring faults or changes to his original story, a warrant for his arrest was issued, and at 7pm on the 2nd of February, he was apprehended by Superintendent Hubert Moore, Charles Thomas, and Inspector Hubert Gold while staying with his sister-in-law for the willful murder of his wife, Julia Wallace. As he was read his arrest, he simply replied, What can I say in answer to a charge of which I am absolutely innocent? The next day at 10.30am, people poured into the Liverpool courtroom in order to catch a glimpse at the proceedings. Police had had to disperse a packed entrance hall of about 200 hopefuls who had arrived too late to secure a place in the courtroom itself. Whilst the prosecution outlined the case against Wallace, he stood in the dock, stoic and composed in a dark suit, his bowler hat perched on a seat next to him. As the prosecuting solicitor read the details, he made misstatement after misstatement, one after the other, totalling 18 errors by the time he had completed his speech. Some of the errors were simple, such as mistaking districts and addresses. Some statements were critical, such as On entering the back door, the accused asked his neighbours to wait in case there was anything wrong. This was in fact the other way round. It was the Johnstons themselves that suggested that they wait. Details like this were left unchallenged, and when asked if he had anything to say, Wallace merely stood and told the pack room, Nothing, sir, except that I am absolutely innocent of the charge. Wallace was later that day made to stand in several lineups for witnesses to positively identify him as the man that they had seen on the night of the 20th of January, making his journey to Menlove Gardens. He then confirmed his solicitor to be that of Hector Munro, of Herbert J. Davis, Burton and Munro, and a member of the chess club, although the two men were not known well to one another. Wallace was then led away to await trial in Walton Prison. Funds for the services of Monroe were supplied partially by Wallace and his younger brother, with substantial donations from both local prudential officers and union members nationwide. They even held a mock trial of sorts, and once they had heard Monroe out on the facts of the case, the union voted to cover the expenses for Wallace's defence, an act which made history as the first time a trade union would guarantee defence costs of a member. As alluded to earlier, there was another witness who had seen Parry on the night of the 20th. A man who now, after Wallace's arrest, chose to speak up about a matter that had been lying heavily on his mind. A man named John Parks. Parks worked as a mechanic at a local taxi rank and garage, a place that acted as something of a hub for overnight traffic in the area. Often the workers there would invite customers in to warm themselves with a mug of tea and a bit of gossip and conversation. On the night of the murder, Parks had heard all about the commotion at the Wallace household and the rumours that had already began flying through the place that Wallace was the man responsible for the crime. Later that evening, however, Richard Parry paid Parks a visit. He appeared agitated, and he'd asked Parks to hose his car down inside and out. Parks turned the high-powered hose to the job, despite thinking to himself that the car seemed fairly clean. When he inspected the interior of the car to ensure that he wouldn't soak anything important, he found a leather glove covered in blood in the passenger compartment. Parry snatched it from him promptly, jokingly saying, If the police found that, they'd hang me. Parry paid Parks for the job, and he took off into the night, leaving Parks with the decision to make. After confiding with his boss before signing out for the night, the pair concluded to have nothing to do with the whole situation, unless Wallace was arrested for the killing of Julia. Now that had come to pass, Parks decided, finally, to speak up. He asked his boss to contact the police about the incident and Superintendent Moore showed up to take the statement and hear Parks' story. Once he had concluded telling the inspector all the details of his finding of the glove, 
Moore simply dismissed the entire event outright and disregarded the entire affair. The committal proceedings began on Thursday, February the 19th, and once again, the prosecuting solicitor repeated the same misstatements in his opening speech to the court that he had made in his previous appearance, this time including several more. This time, however, it proved to be too much, and Schofield Allen, who was appearing on behalf of Munro to defend Wallace, stood to his feet and told the court, Time after time Mr Bishop is suggesting things. It is his duty to present this case fairly, without bias and on the facts. Wallace is on trial for his life, and my friend seems to forget that. Mr Bishop's duty is to present the case for the Crown. Cold, hard, logical facts are needed, and not things to prejudice Wallace. I protest strongly about this, and this is not the first time it has been done. The remainder of the day was dedicated to hearing testimony from various witnesses on the character of Wallace, his relationship with Julia, as well as some details pertaining to the phone call made to the cafe on the night of the 19th of January, including the fact that the phone box was situated 400 yards from Wallace's house in Wolverton Street. The committal proceedings lasted a further six days, passing by with as much public interest as the first. Each morning, queues formed outside the courthouse, with many having to be turned away once capacity had been reached. Witness testimony was heard pertaining to all facets of Wallace's movements on both the night of and the night before the murder, as well as evidence submitted that no force of entry had been noted on Wallace's property, either to the house or the rear garden, along with several statements made concerning Wallace's diaries that he had meticulously kept for the years leading up to the present and that included many references to his life with Julia being one of contentment. The hearing concluded with a statement from Wallace. I plead not guilty to the charge made against me, and I am advised to reserve my defence. I would like to say that my wife and I lived together on the very happiest of terms during the period of some 18 years of our married life. The suggestion that I murdered my wife is monstrous. That I should attack and kill her is, to all who knew us, unthinkable and unbelievable. All the more so when it must be realised that I could not gain one possible advantage by committing such a deed, nor do the police suggest I gained any advantage. On the contrary, in actual fact, I have lost a devoted and loving comrade. My home life is completely broken up, and everything that I hold dear has been ruthlessly uprooted and torn from me. I am now left to face the torture of this nerve-wracking ordeal. I protest once more that I am entirely innocent of this terrible crime. He then sat down silently and awaited the date of the trial. The trial proper began at 10am on Wednesday the 22nd of April at St George's Hall. Just like the pre-trial seatings, the affair was the subject of huge public interest and the courtroom, with room for 300 people, was easily filled, with many hundreds more turned away outside. William Wallace faced the courtroom on that morning and firmly stated his plea, not guilty. The prosecution gave a two hour long overview of the case and the witnesses were called to give evidence. Amongst the topics on that first day, most concentrated on Wallace's movements on the 19th of January, the phone call made to the city calf and the voice on the other end of the phone. PC James Rothwell gave evidence of seeing Wallace at 3.30pm on the 20th whilst he was working. The policeman was well acquainted with Wallace, being both a local to the area and one of his customers. PC Rothwell stated that Wallace was looking haggard and drawn and he was very distressed, unusually distressed. He was dabbing his eye with his coat sleeve and he appeared as if he had been crying. Though through further questioning, he did admit that he was unsure if he was actually crying or if perhaps the cold wind could simply have been stinging his eyes. When Samuel Beatty was cross-examined concerning the phone call, he was asked if he knew Mr Wallace's voice well and if he thought that the voice on the other end of the phone resembled Mr Wallace's voice. His reply was not one of ambiguity. It would be a great stretch of the imagination for me to say that it was anything like that. The remainder of the day continued by questioning witnesses who spoke to Wallace on the night of the 19th of January whilst he made his way to and hunted for Menlove Gardens East. The second day opened with the Johnstons, Wallace's neighbours, present at the time he discovered Julia's body, who gave their account of the evening. Next up were various police officers who responded to the immediate discovery of the murder, including Superintendent Moore, who confirmed with the prosecution that all windows were locked and that there was no evidence of forceful entry to the house. 
Afterwards, Wallace's cleaning lady was called to the stand, who told the court of the missing poker from the fireplace. And then a locksmith, who confirmed that he had examined the locks of Wallace's house for the police the day following the murder, included that though they were both stiff, they were both in good working order. The third day saw queues forming outside the court at 5.30am. It was to be a big day for the trial. William himself was to take the stand for the first time, and the furore outside the court was palpable as thousands were turned away. Under cross-examination, the prosecution heavily insinuated that Wallace had concocted the entire set of events leading up to the murder of Julia, pointing out several key points. Namely, they pointed out that Quattro, if he truly was unknown to Wallace, would have had no possible means to know whether or not Wallace had received his message at the chess club. He pointed out the phone box being a more 400 yards from Wallace's house, and that if Qualtro was a fake in order to lure Wallace away from his home on the night of the 20th to find an address which never existed, it was a plan that relied on the chance successes of a precarious chain of improbable events. He also questioned Wallace as to his conversations with so many people whilst he searched for Men Love Gardens East, suggesting that many were unnecessary and full of details, such as giving the time and over-explaining his activities. They also pointed out that the sheer number of people asked was a result of the address intentionally being wrong. Again, the prosecution were heavily insinuating that the address given to Wallace was incorrect precisely to provide him with an array of witnesses to his alibi. If you had been given the right address, of course, you need not make a number of inquiries. One would have been sufficient. You follow what I mean? The wrong address is essential in the creation of evidence for the alibi. Do you follow that? If you are told of an address which does not exist, you can ask seven or eight, every one of whom would be a witness where you were. The prosecution then followed with making points of both the poor job of a thief, if the crime was indeed a burglary gone awry, on account of the many valuables left untouched, and they probed Wallace on the locks to his doors and why he had such trouble entering the house, suggesting that perhaps he was merely waiting for his neighbours to arrive to provide further witnesses. After more than three hours on the stand, Wallace finally stepped down and made way for Professor James Edward Dibble, pathologist at Liverpool University, who called into question the veracity of the time of death due to the inaccurate method of measuring the state of rigor mortis as the sole predictor. Saturday the 25th of April saw the final day of the trial of William Wallace. With capital punishment yet to be outlawed in England, if he was found guilty, there was a very real chance he would be sentenced to hang. The closing speech for the defence began by drawing heavy doubts as to the likelihood that Wallace made the original phone call to the chess club and in highlighting the accuracy of the time of death and concluded as such. Members of the jury, I have finished. The onus in this matter, the burden of proof, is wholly upon the Crown. You have got a crime here without a motive. You have got a man here against whose character there is not a word to be said. You've got a man here whose affection for his wife cannot be doubted. You are trying a man for the murder of a woman who was his only companion for no benefit. The Romans had a maxim which is as true today as it was then. No one ever suddenly become the basest of men. How can you conceive that such a man with these antecedents doing such a thing as this? Finally, if I may say so, it is not enough that you should think it possible that he did this. Not merely enough, but it is not nearly enough. On looking at the two stories, you may say, well, the story of the defence does not sound very likely, but the story of the prosecution does not sound very likely either. And if that be the state of your minds, then he is entitled to be acquitted. I suggest that this should be the state of your minds. The story for the defence is not very likely, but at least it is consistent with all the facts. The story of the prosecution sounds impossible. It was then the turn for the prosecution to give its closing speech. The speech addressed the two vital points focused on by the defence, that of the phone call and that of the time of death. Let us take the facts on the first. The prisoner admits that on Monday night, about 7.15, he left his house. About 7.15 obviously may mean two or three minutes one way or the other. He gave that statement quite early on, I think the night of the murder, and that statement is not and cannot be varied. The telephone box is 400 yards from his house. Walking five miles an hour, one would do that in rather under three minutes. 
walking four miles an hour in rather over. He is a tall man and one could probably fairly give him a good four miles an hour walking at night. At 7.15 from the telephone box, about three minutes from his house, someone tries to get through to the city calf. My learned friend said, how did the recorder get the fact that nobody knew or could know he was going to be there? He must have got it from the police. I did not. I got it from his client, in the deposition as I put it to him. Inspector Gold, giving his evidence before the magistrates and again here, said, I asked him if he knew anyone who knew he was going to the club and had he told anyone he was going. To that, Wallace said, no, I had not told anyone I was going and I cannot think of anyone who knew I was going. And upon that, I based a statement that nobody would know that he was going or could know. It is suggested somebody might have looked at the match list up in the city cafe, and I think you know from Mr Beatty that that was only provincial, as people might never turn up for their matches, and have acted upon that. Now let me come back. Assuming he left the house on his three minutes journey at 7.15, he could easily have been in that telephone box at 7.18. But by a singular coincidence, the man who wanted him, Quattro, was in that telephone box at the identical time at which Mr Wallace might have been there, and, by another singular coincidence, at that moment was trying to ring up Mr Wallace. That is how it starts. The man in the box is ringing up at a time when, on Mr Wallace's own times, he might perfectly well have been there. The defence went on to explain the ease of disguising one's voice over a telephone call, and once again reiterating that if the man who had made the call was not Wallace, it would be absurd to simply cross one's fingers and hope he received the message, not knowing if Wallace would turn up at the chess club or not, and the numerous other junctions that this plan crossed but could have easily failed were it not for dumb luck. The speech pointed to Wallace's behaviour throughout the evening of the 20th of January up to and after his discovery of Julia's body, and concluded, Now, members of the jury, the points I want to draw your attention to in conclusion are these. First of all, the overwhelming probability that the man who left his house at 7.15 on the evening of the 19th was the man who was in the telephone box about 7.15. He said three minutes later than that, 7.18, only three minutes walk from his house, there is a telephone box which this call goes through. I suggest to you that on that part of the case, a great deal points, if not everything, to the man there being the prisoner. As regards the time of death, the other point that my learned friend said was so vital, I submit that that also is easily established. The man who had made his plans, whether the boy was seen at 6.30 or 6.35 talking to this woman, had between that time and 6.49, practically 20 minutes, and there is no reason to suppose that a man who had done a thing like that would go very slowly. If he did it, he was trying to create an alibi, and he would. I am bound to suggest to you, on behalf of the Crown, that the evidence connecting this man with that message is strong evidence, that the evidence that this woman was alive around about 6.30 is strong evidence, that evidence of what the man did when he came back to the house is strong evidence, and that he was not acting then as an innocent man. The judge gave his final speech to the packed, restless courtroom, emphasising the lack of motive, and dismissed the jury to make their deliberations. It took the jury a single hour to consider the evidence for the case for and against Wallace, and when they returned, the judge stood to give the verdict. The courtroom, so full of chatter and restless onlookers throughout, fell deathly silent to hear the outcome. The foreman of the jury gave the decision. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty, came the reply. When asked if he had anything to say as to why he should not be sentenced to death, Wallace stood calmly, hands behind his back, and stated simply, I am not guilty. I cannot say anything else. Wallace disappeared from view, slowly taking the steps out of the courtroom as the trial concluded. In a twist of events, however, Wallace was not done yet. As Wallace was removed from court and taken back to Walton Prison, the gears were already turning for the defence to launch an appeal against the guilty verdict and it was officially lodged on Monday the 27th of April, stating that the weight of evidence was against the verdict, as consistent with innocence as it was with guilt. The appeal took place on the 18th and 19th of May at the Court of Criminal Appeal in the Strand, London. 
both the defence and prosecution laid out long, exhaustive speeches and once they were completed, the presiding judges allowed the appeal and removed themselves to discuss their verdict. At 4.15pm, in a decision of some uniqueness, the guilty verdict against Wallace was overthrown, not for admission of new evidence or any mistrial by a preceding judge, but for error in judgement by a standing jury. The evidence, it was decided, was not enough to offer a guilty verdict. The conclusion that we have arrived is that the case against the appealant, which we have carefully and anxiously considered and discussed, was not proved with that certainty which is necessary in order to justify a verdict of guilty. William Herbert Wallace left the appeals court and returned to Liverpool a free man. In the months following the appeal, Wallace attempted to return to work at the Prudential, but found quickly that not everyone in Liverpool supported his freedom. He was routinely harassed, making his work and home life equally difficult. He moved house to a small bungalow on the Wirral, just outside of central Liverpool. He commuted from there to an office position the Prudential had moved him to, to allow him to work away from the public eye. In the winter of 1932, William's kidney problems began flaring up again, and in February 1933 he was hospitalised, requiring surgery. The surgery failed, and on the 26th of February 1933, William Herbert Wallace passed away. On the 18th of March, just under two years from his successful appeal, he was buried in the Anfield Cemetery in the same grave as Julia. The case of Julia Wallace is one that has fascinated for decades, and with its meticulous documentation, one that has been worked over time and time again. New information was still being unveiled 50 years on from the original date of the murder, and there has been numerous books based either directly on or heavily influenced by the case, as well as a feature-length film. Nowadays, there are two main schools of thought as to what happened on the nights of the 19th and 20th of January 1931. In the first, we have those that believe Wallace to be the killer, that the crime was coldly worked out, calculated in minute detail, and carried out very nearly to perfection. Those that believe this theory build a case against Wallace that he left home to go to the chess club on the 19th. He made the call on the way, ensuring to fudge the original call to the operator, ensuring that a log would be made. He then proceeded to kill his wife on the 20th while dressed in his Macintosh, stripped off the coat, placing it on her body, and made quick work of the journey to the tram station for 706 to make the journey to Menlove Avenue. Naturally, he knew the address was false and so he made pains to speak to as many people as possible, creating himself an alibi with a great many witnesses. Upon his return, he made an intentional fuss at his front and back door to draw attention to his neighbours, once again gaining more witnesses for his return home and discovery of the body. In this theory, Wallace had to have thought through hundreds of minute details, such as his taking the address down wrongly in the city calf when he received the message, right down to the conversations he had with each witness, ensuring that just enough information was given or received to allow both success as evidence and failure on the part of finding the falsehood of the address at too an early point in the plan. If this is the case, one must ask the question, why would he have done such a thing in the first place? There are further suggestions that his married life may not have been all that Wallace made it out to be, but why would one lie in their own private diaries? There are suggestions that Julia was having an affair, but that all lies in speculation. The Macintosh in the theory does explain how he remained clean during the murder to an extent. However, would it have been possible to contain the blood merely to the Mac and not anywhere else on his body when blood spatter reached seven feet up the walls of the lounge? Some say his behaviour after the murder was too cold, too uncaring for a loving husband grieving for his wife, whilst others point to his stoic personality even before the murder, as well as the pressures to remain strong in a crisis that many judged as amiable for the time. The second theory is that it was another who phoned the calf to leave Wallace the message, pretending to be Cordro to lure him from his home, allowing the murder to be carried out. As there was no forceful entry to the house, it is suggested that the door was knocked, and whoever it was was familiar to Julia and William and voluntarily asked inside the house. The killer then proceeded to murder Julia and flee before Wallace returned home. The Macintosh in this theory was commented on by Wallace himself, who suggested that perhaps Julia tossed it over her own shoulders when she went to open the front door 
outside being as cold as it was. In this case, the murderer is most often theorised to have been Richard Parry. Parry had something of a motive and history of minor criminal offences, including theft. In later life, he continued this trend. Parry also spent time in the city calf and could easily have seen the chess club's timetable pinned to the notice board by the door that detailed Wallace's participation at the club on the 19th. Many years later, in 1981, his then girlfriend, Lily Lloyd, suggested whilst being interviewed for a radio program that she covered for Parry to help create him an alibi. She claimed she told the police she had met Parry at 9pm on the night of the 20th, but in fact it had been much later. How much later she was unsure of and refused to give further details. The details of Parry's whereabouts on the night of the call are also at odds with Lily Lloyd's statement and allow for Parry to have had ample opportunity to have made the call to the calf. And what of the, at the time, glove found in the car covered in blood? These are all very damning on the part of Parry, but are no less circumstantial than the evidence against Wallace. And there are many other theories beyond. Some believe it could have been the neighbours, some a local burglar who had been carrying out a spat of break-ins at the time, and others suggest hybrid theories involving Wallace, Parry and a third man, Joseph Marsden. Almost all evidence for the case against Wallace is as circumstantial as the evidence against Parry or anyone else. Mysteries remain, and with every answer there are new questions. One example being that if it wasn't Wallace in the phone box, why had he not called into the Wallace's house on the night of the 19th? After all, the box was a mere 400 yards away. Edgar Lusgarten, one time president of the Oxford Union, crime novelist and journalist, wrote of the case as a mental exercise. As a challenge to one's powers of deduction and analysis, the case is in a class by itself. It has all the maddening, frustrating fascination of a chess problem that ends in perpetual check. Any set of circumstances that is extracted from it will readily support two incompatible hypotheses. They will be equally consistent with innocence and guilt. It is preeminently the case where everything is cancelled out by something else. The case of the murder of Julia Wallace endures, both intriguing and frustrating in equal parts. With police files now missing, and with many of the direct contacts of the case now deceased, it will, more than likely, maintain its position in perpetual check. <laughs>